Yeah, perfect. Uh, so welcome everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I uh, hope you're all doing well. Uh, just uh, a couple quick points to go through. Uh, we are going to be doing a live Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, so feel free to just submit your questions as they come to you in the questions drop down. Um, we're gonna get to as many as we can within the hour. If we don't get to your question, we will we'll follow up with an email just to make sure uh, everything gets answered. Uh, all questions will be addressed anonymously. And just a quick disclaimer, all information discussed in this webinar is for education purposes only, should not be applied directly to the administration of any particular file or claim. This webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it uh, later on on our website, LinkedIn and YouTube pages. So please feel free to pass them along to your colleagues or use them in team meetings if you wish. We'll be sending everyone a completion certificate uh, following the webinar. And uh, at the end of the webinar, uh, you will be prompted to uh, just fill out a quick survey. Uh, we're also going to be uh, just announcing our, our national tour coming up uh, later this month. So if you want to sign up for that, uh, just click the yes, sign me up and we'll take care of it. And then finally, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, you can email our team at webinar at origin-and-cause.com. Or again, just use that uh, questions drop down. Uh, we'll be monitoring both. Uh, so, uh, for the, I think we'll just uh, let's get started. Paul, if you want to, uh, perfect. So today, crack the code, stress corrosion cracking, uh, SEC demystified, uh, major issue for water-related insurance claims, uh, stress corrosion cracking of copper and brass components. Our uh, speaker today is Paul Amati. Um, from Vancouver uh, in British Columbia. He's a licensed professional engineer in British Columbia and Alberta. He's a mechanical and materials engineer specializing in forensic failure analysis. Uh, he also has uh, a very strong research background in physical metallurgy, metal casting, and advanced processing of light metals. So I'm gonna pass things off to Paul and he's gonna uh, take us through the presentation. All right, thank you, Paul. Thank you so much, Mark, for that intro. So let's go ahead. Here is the outline of our talk today, uh, so we know what to expect. I'll start you off with a short background and an introduction related to stress corrosion cracking, or SCC. We'll emphasize its causes and mechanisms, as well as why it's important to learn about. After that, we'll transition into case studies to illustrate some of the concepts that we've learned and highlight some of the investigation process for SCC-related files. And then we'll talk about some best practices in handling SCC-related claims and, and finishing off with our concluding remarks. Corrosion is a silent, but at the same time, substantial economic drain on Canada. The Association for Materials Protection and Performance, or AMPP, they report a staggering 63 billion Canadian dollars spent on corrosion and corrosion related problems. And to put this into context for you, that's about 3% of our nation's GDP just directed towards corrosion related challenges. And even more concerning is that this number is on the rise. And when I think about these figures, I really can't help but realize that corrosion is a major concern in industry it always will be. So really it's best that we learn more about it and get used to dealing with it. Now let's delve into a phenomenon known as stress corrosion cracking or SCC. This is a specific type of material degradation where stress, and you can think of that as pressure, combines with exposure to a corrosive environment. The outcome of that well, it can lead to catastrophic failures. And one of the most alarming aspects of SCC is that it can happen without any significant prior deformation and often with no clear warning signs. So it's a silent threat with huge implications. But its direct impact on engineering components really came as a surprise to engineers and the public alike right around the 19th century when its effect was initially observed on brass cartridges that were used by the British Army in India. And at that time, no principles had really been established, so it was, it was given several odd names, like caustic embrittlement, season cracking, 
or even chloride embrittlement, delayed failure, just to name a few. But when we discuss SCC, understanding its causes and mechanisms is really key here. So first off, there's stress, the forces or pressures that are applied to a material. And then we have a corrosive environment. This is when a material is exposed to elements like moisture, chemicals, or even gases. And finally, not all materials are created equal. Some have an inherent material vulnerability, meaning that they're naturally more susceptible to SCC than other materials. And recognizing and addressing these factors is important in mitigating some of the risks associated with stress corrosion cracking. So let's further explore SCC. It's important to understand its real world implications. In our homes, in residential areas, SCC can manifest in plumbing systems, which can be concerning given the constant flow of water, in swimming pools with their combination of water and chemicals, outdoor fixtures that are exposed to varying weather conditions and rain, even our metal railings on our balconies that we might take for granted. But on the commercial front, the implications are much more broad. Industrial cooling systems essential for many processes are at risk. Our transportation infrastructure, which underpins our daily commutes and the movement of goods. Marine structures, they're constantly battling saline and humid conditions, especially here in the West Coast where I'm sitting right now. And of course, manufacturing facilities where both raw materials and final products could be affected. And recognizing these common areas of concern helps in targeted prevention and maintenance with SCC related issues. But really, why is it important to learn about stress corrosion cracking? You might be asking yourself, why am I listening to this right now? Well, understanding stress corrosion cracking or SCC isn't just about recognizing a problem, but it's also about leveraging its awareness for tangible benefits. First, by identifying and being aware of SCC, we can pinpoint industries and assets that are particularly prone to it. And this allows us to allocate our resources more strategically, adjust coverage terms. Second, with SCC awareness, we gain a better understanding of the regulatory landscape. It provides support, in ensuring compliance with standards and guidelines specific to industries or different sectors. But most importantly, SEC awareness plays a significant role in risk mitigation. We're in a better position to guide our clients on best safety practices, emphasizing regular inspections, maintenance routines, and these can go a long way in preventing catastrophic failures and ensuring the longevity of assets. So in essence, really being informed about stress corrosion cracking, translates to smarter decisions, safer practices, and really in general, just better outcomes. But continuing on this train of thought, you know, about stress corrosion cracking awareness, we can dig a little deeper into the benefits that directly impact insurance and financial sectors. Thinking about risk assessment with a thorough understanding of stress corrosion cracking, we're better equipped to more effectively evaluate risk profiles. In the context of loss estimation, SEC awareness brings clarity and accuracy when estimating potential financial losses. And lastly, with claims management in mind, armed with our new SEC knowledge, insurance providers can handle stress corrosion cracking related claims more efficiently. And these benefits discussed with those or combined with those we discussed earlier underscore the importance of staying informed and proactive in our approach. But now that we talked a little bit about background information, I wanna show you two case studies to better illustrate some of the concepts that we've discussed so far. Our first case here involves a residential faucet that unfortunately fractured. The focal point of this study is this European faucet. Its construction is or was primarily of brass, and brass is a material that's known for its durability, 
and also aesthetic appeal. But yeah, despite its robust construction, this faucet had only been in service for less than a year. Its short service life or such a short service life immediately flags potential issues that warrant an investigation. But adding some more context to its usage, the faucet was installed at a seasonal dwelling. And this fact provides a little bit of insight into the possible environmental factors and usage patterns that it might have been subjected to. The issue at hand here didn't just pertain to the entire faucet, but was localized on the hot water side. And this narrows down our investigation parameters and might hint at potential temperature or pressure related concerns. So with these details in mind, we're gonna go a little bit deeper into the potential causes and implications and also lessons from this specific case. Our investigation process is methodical usually, but at the same time challenged by certain constraints. For this particular case, right at the get-go, starting with the scene exam, we faced a hiccup. The component had already been removed before we arrived on the scene. And this absence of an in situ inspection means that we had to rely more heavily on our other investigative measures. Our primary approach typically is a visual examination. Often a lot can be learned just by observing the wear and tear and anomalies on a component. To further our insights, we turn to lab level testing, which enables a more in-depth dive into the potential issues at hand. One of the standout tools that we use is the SEM or the electron microscope. And this tool allows us to dig really deep into the microscopic aspects, potentially uncovering clues that are normally invisible to the naked eye. We also perform hardness testing to shed light on a material's integrity or whether it meets industry standards. Also understanding the composition of a material, or in other words, what a metal is really made of gives us insights into whether any manufacturing discrepancies could have contributed to a failure. And another aspect, considering the faucet's functionality, a chemical analysis of water was also conducted. And this helped us ascertain if any corrosive elements could have played a role. But really each of these steps individually and collectively shaped our understanding and conclusions about this faucet's premature failure. So let's turn our attention to the visual exam of our brass faucet here. Some key findings really stood out. First and foremost, we looked at the installation process. Given that over tightening during installation is a common issue, but interesting enough, we found no evidence to suggest that this was the case here. This effectively eliminates one of the more frequent culprits behind failures like this. Looking more closely, we did notice a few localized thread indentations. These marks could potentially indicate points of stress or strain on a component, warranting a little bit more exploration. And looking at the fracture's location here, it wasn't located in an area that we typically consider high stress. And this points toward a more unconventional cause and emphasizes the need for a deeper dive beyond just surface level observations. So taken together, these visual cues can provide an initial direction which guides the subsequent phases of our investigation. Now let's focus on the heart of the faucet's construction, its material. Our investigation identified the material as a brass alloy. And breaking down uh, this alloy to its components, it's made of 39% zinc, 2% lead, and the remainder being copper to balance to 100%. Its applications are widespread. This alloy is commonly used for making hardware and plumbing components, but every material comes with its own set of issues. There's no perfect material. One notable characteristic of this alloy is the high zinc content. While zinc gives our alloy certain strengths and benefits, it also makes the material more susceptible to dezincification or the removal of zinc for certain reasons. This process can weaken the alloy over time and in certain environments lead to premature failure. 
So understanding this material's properties not only sheds light on its strengths, but also on potential areas of concern guiding our ongoing investigation. And looking a little deeper and entering the microscopic realm, we aim to uncover any signs that indicate stress corrosion cracking, or SCC. Of course, it's important to note that SCC can't be confirmed through naked eye examinations alone. It requires metallurgical and fractographic examinations in a laboratory setting. And having said that, let's take a look at the fracture surface. First off, we have this flat fracture surface, and this is a characteristic of certain types of SCC. A flat fracture might suggest that there was little to no deformation of the material before it fractures. And you can think of this like pulling apart licorice or putty. It stretches a significant amount before it breaks. And at the center or the focal point, the fracture will be thinner than the rest of the licorice stick. Whereas in our case, this faucet, it looks more like we broke apart an ice cube or a piece of glass. It didn't stretch. Additionally, surface discoloration stands out. In the context of stress corrosion cracking, discoloration like this can hint at localized corrosive environments or specific chemical interactions that might be promoting crack propagation. And most importantly, the presence of micro cracks, and this is an SEM image from the electron microscope. This is a strong indicator. So SCC often starts as tiny, almost invisible cracks, which under the combined effect of stress and a corrosive environment can grow, leading to catastrophic failures. But taken together, these microscopy findings provide a compelling case for the potential involvement of stress corrosion cracking in this faucet's failure. Now let's transition our attention to the water component. As I mentioned, we conducted um, a thorough testing of the water to identify its potential contributions to the faucet's degradation. An observation was that the water's pH level stood a little high at 7.89, so it was alkaline. And an alkaline environment can impact metal behavior and its interaction with the surrounding elements. Moreover, our tests also detected a number of compounds, specifically nitrates, sulfates, and chlorides. And these were all present in the water. Each of these, especially chlorides, have been associated with promoting SCC in certain metallic materials. But it's crucial to underline that when it comes to stress corrosion cracking, even low levels of chemicals can aid in the corrosion process. The cumulative effect of these chemicals, combined with stress, can significantly amplify the risk of stress corrosion cracking. So these findings, in essence, highlight the multifaceted nature of stress corrosion cracking, where both material properties and environmental factors pay, play important roles. Let's turn our lens over to mechanical and structural aspects of the faucet. Beginning with the installation, a common point of concern, as I mentioned before, was over tightening. But we found no evidence of this. And this removes one of the more frequently observed stress, con stress contributors. But on the other hand, we performed hardness tests. And when we did this, we noticed an inconsistency. For those of you, who have never seen hardness tests, I have a short video here that we can watch. So this is the indenter, and it makes a very small indent on the surface of our metal. It's moving right now, I promise, but it's really exciting. I used to do this a lot in grad school. It takes, uh, depending on the standard you're using, 10 or 15 seconds of dwell time when it's making its indent. Then it switches over to a microscope, and we see this indentation it makes. Looks like a diamond. So measuring certain areas of the diamond, doing a little bit of math, we get a number called the hardness number. In this case, a Vickers hardness number. Um, so very exciting. The tests that we did, they indicated a non-uniform hardness across the material. 
And variation in hardness can create differential stress zones, meaning different stresses in different areas of the material, potentially initiating or propagating cracks. So it's more likely that the material wasn't properly stress relieved after it was manufactured. Stress relieving is an essential step to ensure even stress distribution across a part and prevent internal stress concentrations. So what's the conclusion here? Internal stresses were present in the material and this presents a substantial risk, especially when considering potential for stress corrosion cracking to occur. Now diving into the mechanisms that might be promoting SCC, a combination of material properties, environmental, fracture, environmental factors, and manufacturing practices come into focus. At the forefront is the intrinsic property of our material in question. The brass alloy, by its very nature, is susceptible to SCC. And this material vulnerability sets the stage for potential degradation especially under specific conditions. Compounding this is the presence of chemicals in the water. As our earlier findings suggested, even low levels of certain chemicals can dramatically increase or accelerate the SCC process. And given the water's composition, there's a heightened risk of interaction with brass promoting corrosion. And lastly here, we can't overlook the influence of manufacturing practices. The presence of internal stresses for manufacturing further predisposes the material to cracking. Without proper stress relief post-manufacture, these internal stresses can act as catalysts for SCC when combined with the environmental factors. So really a trifecta of mechanisms, so to speak, material properties, environmental influences, manufacturing residual stresses, they all collaboratively increase the risk of stress corrosion cracking in this context. And drawing our investigative journey here to a close, a clear picture begins to emerge, which paints a comprehensive understanding of a root cause or the root causes behind the failure. The primary diagnosis here, backed by a rigorous metallurgical examination, points toward the combined effect of stress corrosion cracking and desinkification. These mechanisms, when combined, can be particularly devastating. And zooming into the causative factors, the three primary culprits that were identified were the internal stresses, the corrosive environment, and the inherent vulnerability or susceptibility of the material that was used. And it's noteworthy that despite being in operation for less than one year, this level of degradation occurred. So this accelerated type of failure underscores the inherent issues. Um, and going towards eliminating some of the external contributors, our analysis again found no evidence of over-tightening, and this suggested that it wasn't an installation deficiency. And while multiple factors really contributed here, all the data predominantly points towards one overarching issue, which is a manufacturing deficiency. Moving on, this is our second case study. And while the previous one was in a residential setting, this is more of a commercial example. And a very important factor here is that we were on the scene before the valve was removed and the situation was repaired. Diving in, we focus on an incident involving a brass valve connected to a heat pump. The valve's failure here didn't just lead to a system malfunction, it resulted in a widespread discharge of water and glycol. And the implications were more far-reaching here, impacting the operations of a hotel and an attached conference center. But really understanding the nuances of this case offers insights into the importance of component integrity, especially in large-scale operational setups. And similar to the previous investigation, our process played out in stages, from site examinations to highly specialized laboratory analysis. Each step was crucial in piecing together this puzzle. 
the utilization of microscopy allowed for understanding of the fracture, while composition analysis ensured that the material's integrity was thoroughly evaluated. Each phase of this investigation was vital in steering us closer to the root cause. So during the visual examination phase, some distinct features became apparent to us. The presence of tool marks and rounded edges were clear indicators of overtightening, which is a significant concern. Overtightening can place additional stress on a component, making it more prone to failures. Also, a concerning omission was noted, and this was the absence of a flexible hose, so we can see it's connected to a rigid pipe. And using or the use of a flexible hose was recommended by the manufacturer in this case. And these type of flexible hoses play an important role in reducing vibrations and also mechanical wear. Uh, our valve here was also manufactured from brass. However, it was a slightly different alloy. This free machining type of brass alloy was made of 60% copper, 38% zinc, and 2% lead. And it, it also is a preferred choice when hardware and plumbing fixtures are concerned. However, like I mentioned before, every material has its own Achilles heel. And in this case, the high zinc content makes this brass variant prone to dezincification also. And this is a process that can weaken the alloy over time, making it more susceptible to failure. Let's talk more about some of the testing that was performed during our investigation. Shifting our focus to mechanical stress aspects, we perform torque measurements on the valve. So torque, in essence, gives us an understanding of how much force has been used or was used uh, during tightening. The results were pretty telling. The measured torque passed the manufacturer's recommended levels by a staggering 87%. And such a deviation from recommended values can really strain the material and significantly contribute to premature failures. And please remember that we were on this scene before the valve was removed from the pipe. And if repairs had taken place before we were called in, we would have never had this critical piece of information. So having said that, let's take a look at the fracture surface again. And See, we see our telltale signs of SCC, the flat fracture, indicating a little to no deformation of the material before it fractured. The surface discoloration stands out, and importantly, the presence of micro cracks. These are strong indicators of SCC as well. And I need to stress here once more that stress corrosion cracking isn't something that can be confirmed with a visual examination just with the naked eye, more advanced techniques and metallurgical evaluation is always needed to confirm the case. And um, in my opinion, electron microscopy is something that always helps and is necessary. One of the critical factors we considered in our analysis is the surrounding environment. And the component under question here was in constant contact with a heat transfer agent. Specifically, it's a mixture of water and glycol. A concerning issue in this case is the decomposition of glycol. It can break down into glycolic and formic acids over time. And both of these acids are notably aggressive towards metals, particularly copper and its alloys, including brass. The corrosive environment likely promoted wear and deterioration potentially leading to the failure that we observed. The vulnerability of such materials in this environment always demands careful consideration and monitoring. So here's our SCC Venn diagram once more. On the one side, we have our brass alloy that's susceptible to stress corrosion cracking. The components persistent exposure to water and glycol mixture introduce another layer of concern and also the combination of over tightening induced stress and the rigid connection fostered some stress accumulation here. So we have our three requirements for stress corrosion cracking. 
stress, as susceptible material, and the environment, and these all collaborate to increase the risk of stress corrosion cracking in this context. To wrap up our investigation, the conclusions were unequivocal. The fracture resulted from stress corrosion cracking, or SCC. The onset of the stress corrosion cracking was facilitated by the simultaneous existence of internal stresses in a corrosive environment. Digging deeper into the stress source, the analysis confirmed or identified over-tightening as the culprit here, which indicates an installation oversight. And most importantly, our examination found no grounds to attribute this failure to a manufacturing deficiency. So now that we've been through a couple cases, let's talk about some important lessons learned and best practices when it comes to SCC-related vows. In the realm of insurance, subrogation potential can be influenced by a lot of factors, each holding significant weight in the outcome. At the forefront here is timing and notification. The swiftness with which an incident is reported and the clarity of the communications can make a profound difference. Timely action ensures that evidence remains unaltered and stakeholders are promptly aware of the situation. Equally important here is documentation and evidence retention. Having comprehensive records and preserving evidence is indispensable. It acts as the foundation upon which claims are built. And without, the sub and without it, the subrogation potential can be severely compromised. Lastly, collaborating with experts can't be understated. By partnering with knowledgeable experts, the nuances of a case can be better understood, increasing the likelihood of a successful outcome. But let's talk a little bit more about each of these factors. And like I mentioned, subrogation success often hinges on two crucial elements, timing and notification or communication. Starting with prompt identification, it's important to spot subrogation prospects as early as possible. And this proactive approach sets the stage for all subsequent efforts. Early involvement of specialists can make a world of difference. By bringing in experts at the outset, we ensure that the case is handled with the necessary expertise from the get-go. And I have to note here again that the brass valve at the conference center we made it to the scene before it was removed, and that allowed us to measure the torque. But if we weren't contacted on time and remediation had already taken place, we wouldn't have had that key piece of information. We also have to remember that timeliness matters. The sooner the efforts are initiated, the better the chances of a successful recovery. It's a simple but profound truth in this realm. But who do we involve? Well. Engaging engineers and experts gives us a comprehensive understanding of the situation, allowing for more informed decisions throughout the process. But lastly, communication or effective communication ties everything together, ensuring all parties involved are aligned and informed, maximizes efficiency and reduces potential hurdles down the line. So in essence, the clock and also clarity play pivotal roles in optimizing subrogation outcomes. The backbone of any solid case lies in its documentation and evidence retention. First up here, incident documentation. Capturing a precise and detailed record of the event as it unfolded is vital. This provides an initial foundation for understanding the case. And following closely to that is the scene investigation. On-site examinations can reveal important details and findings that might be otherwise overlooked. It's all about specifics. For example, in the case of the valve again, we noticed that the rigid hose was used instead of a flexible one. And that wouldn't have been possible without a scene exam. Now, let's not forget about the human element witness statements, direct accounts from those who observed the incident 
can offer invaluable insights and fill potential gaps in understanding. Equally important are maintenance and inspection records. This historical data gives us a clear picture of the asset's condition and maintenance over time, which can shed light on any potential issues. And lastly, preserving the chain of custody ensures the integrity of our evidence. It's about making sure that what we have is genuine, untampered, and credible. And together, these pillars reinforce the foundation of a robust and compelling case, underlining the importance of meticulous record keeping and evidence preservation. And within the realm of subrogation, Collaborating with experts isn't just an added advantage, it's a necessity. To start, the specialized knowledge that experts bring to the table undoubtedly strengthens the process. They provide depth and clarity, and they can transform the complex into comprehensible. Emphasizing again that in cases such as those with SCC, lab level testing is needed to actually confirm the mechanisms. Then there's the pivotal role that they play in evidence collection. Experts with their precise methods and techniques ensure that evidence is not only collected, but also preserved in a matter that helps build a solid and compelling case. Thoroughness and attention to detail mean that our files are primed and ready, even as they progress toward litigation. With expert back data and insights, we're better equipped to navigate the legal landscape. And lastly, insights from areas like engineering don't just elucidate the technical aspects, they actively increase our chances of a successful recovery. In essence, collaboration with experts transforms our approach, making it more informed, robust, and effective. Now, to summarize our deep dive here into SCC or stress corrosion cracking and its implications on subrogation, a thorough, ident ident excuse me, a thorough understanding of SCC isn't just beneficial, it's a foundational requirement. It equips us to tackle the complexities inherent to these types of cases. And SCC subrogation isn't a solidary and solitary endeavor. It fundamentally demands expert collaboration. Our efforts are exponentially enhanced when we team up with those who possess niche knowledge and experience. It's clear that to effectively navigate stress corrosion cracking related cases, we must actively partner with experts. And their expertise paves the way for more robust strategies and approaches to these files. Our ultimate goal here is to optimize recovery potential. And with all these elements in place, we're better positioned or more well positioned to maximize success in these subrogation efforts. So thank you very much for your time. And this brings us to the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, yeah, we've got some already. Um, and if anyone has uh, some that they've been sitting on, yeah, feel free to submit them now. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, two here that are uh, somewhat related. So this uh, pertains to the first case study, and it was what could be in the water to be related. What could be in the water to be related to the fracture? Seeing how it's drinking water. Um, well, it. Yeah, that's a good question. It really depends on the type of material that's being used in a specific case. Like for example, if you have a stainless steel or especially like an austenitic stainless steel, then that's more sensitive to chloride induced SCC. On the other hand, uh, high strength aluminum alloys are more prone to SCC in marine environments. Or when we think about copper or some copper alloys, they're more vulnerable in ammonia-containing environments. So, or even magnesium alloys are also um, prone to SCC when they're exposed to chloride-containing environments. So it really depends on what material you have and what's in the water. Okay, so uh, kind of on that topic, uh, what are normal 
uh, or acceptable alkaline levels? Uh, I think up to 8.5 is even something that I've heard, but that's a question that's that you know changes with different regions. Every region has its different type of drinking water and different type of chemicals that they have. But as far as I remember, I think up to 8.5 I've even noticed. And is that um, material dependent as well? Um, well, more? sorry, what was the rest of the question? Or, or is that just sort of a, a standard number, it's sort of all encompassing? Um, the, like the ranges that can be detected yeah. in drinking water, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so this one, this would be about the second case study. Uh, what would the signs of over tightening look like? Oh, well, it's more, um, I guess we can go back to that one. Yeah, so we, we look for these types of tool marks here, if you can see here and here. And brass is relatively soft. So if you use a lot of force, you can really abrade it. So tool markings, really easy. The and, then, and then related to that, uh, how does the uh, torque test work? So today is the next slide, there are two slides. Well, you use a torque wrench and it measures the torque as you are turning it or you know, tightening it or untightening something. So, so in this you case, you'd be, you're untightening. Or you're untightening, exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, got it. Um, so on, uh, so this is a question about the, the hardness test. Uh, do you see higher variation in hardness of materials uh, that have been manufactured in uh, China as opposed to North America? Oh, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure I've noticed anything specific, to be honest with you. But it's certainly a possibility. I mean, depending on the process that they use, heat treatments post manufacture, it could be that schedule of heat treatments are not proper. It could be that, you know, a furnace is malfunctioning during a certain run and they're not being heat treated at the correct level or time. So, really, it, it could affect any manufacturing setup, like from any country. Okay, so this, uh, this one is, we're still on that case data number two. Um, when glycol breaks down to acid content, is this testable or is there a flushing slash replacement schedule or recommended additives? Um, it, I suppose testable in, in, in what nature? I mean, you can test the compound to see what type of, what type of material or what type of elements are there or, or what type of other compounds are found or present in the mixture. Um, there, I would suggest each manufacturer would have their own recommended schedules for replacing the, uh, the working fluid. And it's also important that you need to avoid moisture in these, uh, in these systems as well. Okay, fantastic. Um, when considering the Venn diagram for corrosion, does the operation does operation in a heated environment, uh, i.e. heat exchanger tubes, lend itself to an environment uh, consideration or stress consideration? Uh, in general, depending on the material and depending on the chemicals, higher temperature can accelerate stress corrosion cracking. Just to answer that question. Okay. Uh, let's see. So yeah. So. So we saw some coming in. So um, what is the most common cause of SCC, of flexible gas appliance connectors? Flexible gas appliance. Well, I'd have to know what the material is made of because each material has its own most common cause. So like I said before, if we're looking at stainless steels or austenitic stainless steels, like the very common ones that we see are grade 304 and 316, these are more prone to SCC in a chloride environment, whereas aluminum alloys like 7075 and 2024 are more prone to SCC in marine environments. So it really depends on the material. 
Okay, uh, let's see. Um, some, uh, some tool markings can be made. So again, we're, we're this actually this slide's perfect. Uh, some tool markings can be made by using the incorrect uh, size of wrench. Uh, so would that not stand up in court? Oh, that's a good question. Hmm. Well, I think every specific case, we would need to evaluate it based on the data. It's hard to tell, or it's hard to judge based on using a wrong tool. But um, it's really mostly about, I mean, even if you do have the right tool, you can apply too much pressure. And same same goes with using the wrong tool. It's all about how much effort you use in tightening. I mean, even if it's a plastic component, some people can wrap it with a rag and over tighten it just by hand. So sometimes tools aren't even involved. But yeah, over tightening can happen no matter what you're, if you're using the right tool or the wrong tool. And I guess that's when, that's, uh, that's when you know, a torque test would come in handy too. Yeah. Okay. Um... How could inspections prevent it either case study? And what signs should they have been looking for? Well, it depends on, so th this is a difficult question, especially with um, something like a faucet. It's not something that you would look at a lot, you know, looking at that thread area, it's usually hidden from view. So it's not something that would have been inspected. But when we talk about a more of a commercial setting, there are different methods to detect SCC. Um, for example, we can do ultrasonic testing that uses sound waves to detect cracks. There's also radiographic testing, which is the same principle, but using x-rays instead. Um, another more common variant is using dyes. So a, a liquid or a visible dye is applied to a surface and it penetrates the cracks. And then a, a type of material called the developer is applied, which draws the penetrant out of the cracks, making them visible. And um, in certain instances, we can also use eddy current testing, which is, which is on the principle of electromagnetic induction, and this detect flaws in the material. So it depends on what industry we're, we're looking at and what the size of the component is, and, and yeah. Things like that. Yeah, well said. Um, okay, so depending on the application, are there varying maximum zinc content percentages, um, such as between a bathroom sink valve and a fire sprinkler valve? Hmm. Uh, that's a very specific question. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're really in the weeds here. Okay. Well. Hmm. Let me go back to one of my composition slides here. Uh, yeah, that, that's that's hard to say. That's something that I have to think about. Um. Yeah. Sorry. Unfortunately, I, well, it's hard yeah, to say what type of zinc levels would be appropriate. But there are certainly standard alloys, and some of them, or you know, there are low zinc alloys and high zinc alloys. Uh, this, sorry, this one, this kind of goes back to a previous question. Um, what are some signs of over tightening in a case uh, that being, of something being over tightened by hand? It's like you said, oh. with the, you know, the rag or. So uh, unfortunately it's, it's tough to detect something that's been like bar being cracked uh, right off the bat. It's tough to detect. Uh, over tightening right by hand and you know that's something that we had noticed a lot with um, toilet connectors and their polymer couplings so these had an issue with different areas that were high stress concentrators and would crack after some time in operation so it's it's you know extremely difficult to prove something like that over tightening by hand but you know you could look at the threads to see if, see if there's any damage to the threads would be my first indication. Okay. Um, have you seen any manufacturers post a recommended lifetime for products? Um, 
you know, for example, you know, replace after 10 years of use. Uh, I haven't seen those with manufacturers specifically, but, you know, there are different standards and, and guides that exist in industry to, to monitor, mostly for monitoring, and the applications of these different types of materials in SCC grown industries. For example, the oil and gas industry has NACE, the National Association of Corrosion Engineers, and they, um, they provide like information and schedules for sour environments. So these are environments that have hydrogen sulfide in them. And of course, in the nuclear power industry, there's the NRC, and they have guidelines related to SCC concerning uh, pressure vessels and pipe work. Um, you could also think about boilers and, and pressure vessels again. So ASME has uh, the pressure vessel code. And these are again, guidelines on design and construction addressing potential SCC issues. So, yeah. So quite a few, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, are braided hoses or faucets better than plastic hoses uh, for resisting SCC? Are braided hoses better than... Um, I'm not exactly sure. Well, plastic hoses or braided hoses. I mean, braided hoses also have that polymer portion that are in the braided. The braided, the braided component just comes to... Uh, give it some structural integrity. So even a braided hose has a plastic component inside of it. But that all depends on, on the environment that's being used. Like if you have a braided stainless steel hose, you have to be careful of what chemicals you have around it, especially those that are under a sink. And people store a lot of chemicals under the sink, like bleach and these off gas and all, all this gas and chloride gas can affect um, stainless steel. So it depends on the environment that we're using them in. Okay, I think that just about wraps up the questions. Um, and we'll stick around for another couple of minutes, but uh, assuming nothing else comes in, uh, that, uh, that just about wraps it up. So everyone, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Paul, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, yeah, really fascinating. Thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you.